Hello, everyone. Welcome to another virtual conversation in the series we're holding here, the series of virtual conversations we're holding here at the Sharmin and Bijan Musavaram Muni Center for uh, um, Iran and Persian Gulf Studies at Princeton University. I have the utmost pleasure of having uh, Dr. Eric Loeb with me today. Um, uh, Dr. Loeb is an associate professor in the Department of Politics and International Relations at Florida International University. He studies how development and politics come together, fascinating research um, uh, in Iran and across the Middle East, and how development is instrumentalized by both state and non-state actors as a tool for soft coercion, as he calls it. He holds a PhD um, uh, at, uh, from Princeton University here, so we're uh, virtually welcoming uh, him back uh, at Princeton. And uh, uh, there he wrote his award-winning dissertation and uh, the basis of the book he will be talking uh, with us today. Uh, the book is called Iran's Reconstruction Jihad, Rural Development and Regime Consolidation After 1979. It came out in 2020 with Cambridge University Press, and I am really excited that we'll uh, get to talk about this book, this very important contribution to the field of Iranian studies. Uh, Dr. Loeb's articles have appeared in the International Journal of Middle East Studies, Iranian Studies, Middle East Critique, the Middle East Journal, the Third World Quarterly, and uh, other places. So uh, without further ado, let me uh, ask uh, Eric to uh, talk with us a little bit about his book, and then we will have a conversation um, um, uh, for about half an hour after he finishes. Thank you so much, Eric, for accepting our invitation. And um, the screen is yours. OK, thank you very much for having me. And before I share my screen, I just want to thank you and uh, Dr. Gamari Tabrizi uh, for, for inviting me to speak, for the center for having me. And of course, I, I also want to thank my mentors at Princeton and the Department of Near Eastern Studies, uh, without whom I, I could not have uh, researched and written this uh, dissertation in this book. So I just want to make sure I say that and, and thank you for having me. I'm going to, I'll start my presentation now. Okay, so the uh, the title of the book is uh, is Reconstruction Jihad: Rural Development and Regime Consolidation After 1979. Um, as you said, it was published uh, this year with Cambridge University Press. And um, I'm going to speak about the uh, the main research question, the argument, um, the contribution that the book makes uh, or attempts to make, the methodology that I use to research and write the project and then the findings uh, that I have. So in terms of the, uh, the main question, and, um, and you articulated it somewhat in the introduction, is that I look at uh, what explains uh, the, the resilience of the Islamic Republic uh, as a regime, as a state, uh, beyond just coercion, when I, when I get into the contribution, I'll talk about how the literature focuses a lot on the Islamic Republic's coercive uh, institutions to explain consolidation and power. And, and here I'm really looking at development and other non-coercive uh, aspects of the state in terms of, and the, and the argument I make is that uh, looking at how since 1979, uh, the Islamic Republic has uh, used or instrumentalized uh, development to con consolidate power at home and to project influence abroad, um, and even how it's played a role in the Islamic Republic's uh, state building processes and outcomes over the last 40 years. So here's the uh, the slogan of the organization. Uh, this is the logo that you you often see when you when you um, when you study or when you research construction jihad, uh, the the all together Hame Baham slogan, all together towards uh, reconstruction, that the uh, organization used and that also uh, Ayatollah Khomeini used when he announced the establishment of the organization in 1979 to try to instill cohesion 
uh, within the organization, as well as the, of course, call for jihad. And it's important to note, and this is something that members of the former members of the organization I spoke with in Iran emphasized, is that jihad is the call to jihad and participation in the organization and joining the organization was not a, a military struggle, but was a collective and an individual struggle or effort to improve the society and even the self uh, through rural development, reconstruction and development and other positive pursuits. So uh, the book also looks at the, the, the framing uh, strategies and tactics of the organization and how elites also like uh, Ayatollah Khomeini and others uh, use this framing to, to help advance uh, the organization. So uh, in terms of um, in terms of the contribution uh, that the project makes, the pardon me, the again, as I said, it, this really tries to go beyond the literature of the Islamic Republic, uh, where so much emphasis is on its uh, its coercive and uh, institutions, and so. Um, Again, I try to move beyond that. I don't dispute that coercion and repression is not important to the Islamic Republic state formation, consolidation, uh, and even overseas activities. Uh, but also, you know, looking at the, the non coercive dimensions, as you said, the soft power uh, dimensions of this uh, is a way that I really try to move the literature forward uh, through this project. And not just, I mean, this really is a book that is the first book in English that looks at uh, Reconstruction Jihad as a central unit of analysis, both looking at it from a developmental standpoint, but also a political one. And uh, not just looking at how the organization has evolved on an organizational and even micro level in terms of looking how its individuals uh, have, have evolved over the last 40 years, but also how that evolution is a microcosm of, the, of not just the changes uh, in the Islamic Republic over the last 40 years and even comparing pre and post revolutionary Iran, but also the continuities that we see as well between the, the regime of the Shah and the Islamic Republic. There's again this emphasis on change in the literature, a rupture, uh, you know, pre and post 1979. And the case of construction jihad or reconstruction jihad is instructive in the sense that it also shows the continuities that, that exist, even if the participants and the elites try to reframe it and make it look like these uh, organizations and activities are, are drastically different than from the pre-revolutionary era. And then it, it really, the, the case of Reconstruction Jihad, even though I, I really adopt an institutional approach in the way that I uh, organize and write the book, is that it really sheds light on lots of different aspects of the Islamic Republic in terms of its mobilization, its, uh, its co consolidation, its, you know, how it undertook warfare during the Iran-Iraq War, uh, its bureaucracy, which Construction Jihad uh, or Reconstruction Jihad became part of. Uh, and we'll I'll talk more about that, the, the factionalism within the organization, but also, of course, with, uh, within the elite of the Islamic Republic, associational life and state society relations, uh, foreign policy, because, of course, the organization uh, engaged in activities in the broader Middle East and Muslim world beyond Iran, and then also a cultural production and how the uh, the organization's former members and how uh, political elites uh, engage in cultural production to try to revive or maintain revolutionary and religious values in, in the polity and in society. So in terms of the methodology that I use, the book relies on 130 semi-structured inter interviews with government officials, uh, former members of the organization, uh, development experts and rural residents, in different parts of Iran, as well as in Lebanon, because there is a chapter that looks at uh, reconstruction jobs activities in Lebanon with Hezbollah. So I was able to do some research on the ground there, although it was more difficult. Uh, I actually had an easier time doing it in Iran than in Lebanon, even though Lebanon is an open country. Once you start working on an organization that cooperated and then became part of Hezbollah, uh, there's obviously some obstacles and constraints to deal with. And this research took place during uh, four trips, three, three to Iran and one to Lebanon between 2009 
2012. And then to triangulate these interviews or to supplement them, I did archival research as well in different libraries and archives uh, in both Iran and Lebanon uh, that I've, that I've lifted, list, listed here. And I, I also, um, one library that I didn't mention here is the Library of Congress in Washington that also contains some very valuable resources uh, for this project that I went to after these trips that also helped. So here are the locations that I went to in Iran to interview. Uh, essentially, uh, I went with, uh, of course, I went with a, a plan and, and uh, how I would interview people and the questions that I would ask. Uh, we could talk more about that in the Q&A. And, but essentially, I, was, I went to where I could go, where uh, people would meet with me, where people would take me. Uh, of course, I would have ideally wanted to go around the entire country, but essentially my research was confined to the north, to, uh, in, to the center in Iran, uh, Tehran, uh, Isfahan, Yazd, and then down south in Shiraz and Boucher. I was able to go to, up to the, the northwest of Tabriz and Azerbaijan. Um, but uh, again, essentially it was like snowball sampling technique where you would meet an interviewee and then he would refer you to others and you basically go where you can go um, with, with um, hopefully not encountering too many difficulties. So um, that's kind of how I was able to perform my research. And then the, the libraries and archives were predominantly based in, in Tehran uh, where I went, uh, the, the National Library and Archive, Parliamentary Library, the Libraries and Archive of the Ministry of Agricultural Jihad, which in 2001, Reconstruction Jihad merged with the Ministry of Agriculture to form that ministry. So a lot of documents about the organization or reports are located uh, in, in the ministry's libraries today in Tehran and even outside of Tehran, of course. So in terms of the findings, uh, the book really, the starting point of the book really starts with pre-revolutionary Iran, with the, the white revolution, the land reform, the oil boom, these large structural forces that were happening in the country that narrowed the urban-rural divide, that uh, triggered waves of, or forces of rapid modernization, uh, of which former Reconstruction Jihad members were a part of in terms of uh, many of them having grown up in, uh, in villages or provinces. And then, uh, you know, during this time of the white revolution and of the oil boom of the 1960s and 70s, they experienced mobility where they went to universities uh, and, and found jobs in uh, provincial capitals or in Tehran in the capital. Uh, and so the book really starts there in terms of setting the stage. And also the white revolution and land reform were important because, um, you know, rural reconstruction and development did not start in 1979. It actually started in, in force uh, in, in 1962 uh, with the Shah's white revolution, with the literacy, hygiene, and extension corps that he deployed uh, to villages. And... Um, and so Reconstruction Jihad, even though it tried to frame itself as a new reconstruction and development organization, in many ways it was imitating uh, the activities uh, and initiatives and projects and services that the Shah had undertaken during this time. So it was important to, uh, to include that in the book in the beginning and also to set the stage for the Iranian revolution and the establishment of the organization in 1978 and 1979. Of course, the uh, members of the organization, the founders of the organization would participate as students and as professionals in uh, the Iranian revolution and in political activities against the Shah, both in Iran and uh, outside of Iran in, in different countries, Europe, the United States and elsewhere. Uh, and so in terms of, you know, a theoretical contribution, when you look at the way that the organization is established, I really emphasize bi-directionality in terms of this mobilization that's happening both at the grassroots level where founders and members of the organization are taking an initiative to, uh, to start the organization and, and, and little by little, they're receiving increasing support materially and, uh, and symbolically from political elites at the top. So we see this bi-directional process in terms of how the organization is established and mobilized 
Um, and I also use concepts uh, called uh, bricolage and boundary activation that shows that um, the organization is uh, not doing something new, which is what I argue, even though uh, with the, through the concept of boundary activation, it really tries to insist that it is doing something new and frame itself as such. And so in the process, uh, the members of the organization and political elites in Iran are trying to set this boundary through discourse, through rhetoric, that this is uh, different than the Shah's. Not only is it different than the Shah's core, Sepahe Danesh, Behdash, and Tarwij, but it's also uh, correcting the mistakes that they made, that these organizations, they argue, did damage to the provinces and villages, even if that may not be the truth. And like you know, any organizations, when you look at the record, both of the core and Reconstruction Jihad, you see that they did some positive things and negative things, right? That the, the track record was not necessarily clear cut. So these are some of the, the concepts that I introduce in the early stages of the book. Um, and in terms of the, uh, the, the expansion of the organization, the way that the organization expanded itself was, right, was by really taking advantage or exploiting the duality that existed early on in the Islamic Republic and its institutions. So in terms of trying to gain recognition, responsibilities and resources, and this is really, again, that bi-directionality, the members weren't just given recognition, responsibilities and resources by the state, but really had to fight for it and really establish themselves. And the way that they did that uh, is that they really uh, exploited this duality in the state and they, they pinned um, the revolutionary institutions, the Revolutionary Council in Tehran, uh, against the, um, the prime minister, Bazargan at the time, and even the president, uh, Beni Sadr, and the bureaucracy that they controlled, these, the, the bureaucracy and, and the prime minister and the president did not want uh, revolutionary organizations like Construction Jihad to expand. Um, and so they had, uh, the way that the organization expanded was to circumvent the prime minister and the president and work with people like uh, Beheshti in the Revolutionary Council and others to, to be able to expand. Um, so the, the book looks at the way that that happened. And, um, and really from below, the organization represented a base of radical and pious or religious activists and revolutionaries that Khomeini and the Islamic Republic, uh, Republican Party, IRP, had to pay attention to and had to cater to um, and used as a base against uh, the, the center left um, and other uh, competing forces and parties in Iran. And so over time, you know, between February 1979 to June 1979, the organization was able to convince Khomeini and the IRP to establish Reconstruction Jihad officially as a revolutionary organization and a parallel organization to the bureaucracy or to many ministries that were undertaking similar tasks as the organization. And in the process, uh, Construction Jihad undermined and, and, and really um, played a role in marginalizing uh, Bazargan and members of the center left and the, uh, the, 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 um, the Freedom Party uh, of, of Iran that was eventually you know, really marginalized by November of 1979. Uh, moving into the, uh, the hostage crisis. So in terms of other things that led to the expansion of the organization was the Cultural Revolution, where members of the organization that were, let's say, more of a pious mindset uh, undertook activities that went just beyond material development and reconstruction, but also faith-based material and reconstruction. So going out to the villages and doing cultural and religious activities distributing Qurans and, uh, and other religious texts, organizing uh, religious study groups and, and working with clerics to, to deliver sermons um, and really focusing on, on Islamizing uh, the, the Iranian countryside and really getting into identity politics. Another, uh, and, and another thing, the way, the, way the, the Cultural Revolution contributed to the expansion of the organization is that the universities were closed for three years in Iran. So this allowed a lot of students to join the organization. It gave them disposable time to join and participate in the organization. Another major event, of course, that led to the expansion of the organization was the Iran-Iraq War, which really expanded the organization's responsibilities beyond just rural reconstruction and development into logistical support for uh, Iranian forces on the front. 
So the, the organization's engineers, doctors, uh, and, and others went out on the, uh, the front to help the military building infrastructure on the front, uh, pontoon bridges, hospitals, clinics, uh, the, the physicians and, and first responders of reconstruction job uh, treated the uh, wounded combatants on the front. And, and so this was an event that really helped expand the organization in terms of its, its numbers as well as its responsibilities. And uh, in terms of helping the, or, the uh, Islamic Republic consolidate power during the 1980s against its opponents beyond the center left, um, you know, Marxist, communists, uh, Shah loyalists and royalists uh, and, and others was to really penetrate the villages, um, even though there was an in, uh, a closer integration between rural and urban areas, as I discussed during the 1960s and 70s, it allowed the Islamic Republic to further penetrate the villages physically, but also ideationally in terms of the different services the organization offered, infrastructure, hygiene, education, and as I mentioned, culture and religion, among other activities. So here's a picture of the, um, a, a group of members that provided logistical support to forces on the front. And these, uh, this group right here was referred to as the Sangar Sazane B. Sangar, the, the trench builders without trenches. And this name really caught on during the war. Uh, these were individuals who basically were presented as courageous individuals who uh, went out on the front to dig trenches because the Iran-Iraq war, the longest conventional war of the 20th century was fought in the trenches. And these young men uh, went out there and risked their lives to build trenches uh, to, where, to house Iranian forces and also to conduct, uh, to allow, to build essentially a staging ground for Iranian forces to launch operations against Iraqi forces and to be protected and defended in the trenches. And so they were called this because they didn't have trenches themselves to protect them while they were digging the trenches. So, you know, as a result, and, and um, former uh, members of this, of this unit talked to me about this, uh, they lost 3,000 of their members. Um, and so, you know, to this day, the, the trench builders without trenches uh, are commemorated for, for their heroic activities. And so here's a picture of them and they were officially part of, of Reconstruction Jihad and coordinating very closely with the Iranian military and the uh, Revolutionary Guard under the, the Central Command. Um, what will happen is that several years into the organization's existence between 1979 up until 1983, so in 1983, the organization transitions from being a revolutionary organization to a government ministry. And this becomes very controversial, actually, because up until 1983, the members of the organization saw themselves as antithetical to the Shah's bureaucracy, that they saw the, the Shah's ministers and civil servants as sitting in Tehran, drinking tea, collecting their paychecks, not going out to the villages and really making a difference. And they saw themselves as the anti-bureaucrat. And by you know, five years into the organization's existence, by 1983, all of a sudden they become bureaucrats, they become a ministry. And, uh, the, and I explained the reasons why this happened. So initially the organization, when it started out, really depended a lot on its own resources, the resources of its members to get started. And by 1983, it was very much dependent on the resources of elites. And so, of course, the elites were factionalized in Iran um, between leftists and rightists and, and, and moderates, and they all had different uh, views. They actually agreed on something in terms of why the organization should become a ministry. So there was a moment of elite consensus among these factions. And because the organization became increasingly dependent on state resources, as opposed to their own resources, they were basically at the mercy of elite preferences and designs in terms of the bureaucratization of the organization. The other thing too, is that there became intense factionalism like in the Islamic Republic itself or in its government uh, between members of the organization. Like I said, some were more interested in faith-based reconstruction development, others more material faith-based, I'm sorry, more material reconstruction development. And they also differed in opinions. Some members did not want to become a ministry and become like what they called the Shah's bureaucrats. And others um, wanted to become part of the ministry because they wanted to get salaries. They wanted to get uh, benefits, promotions, all 
the, uh, the, the, the benefits and privileges that come with being part of the bureaucracy and actually lobbied for it. So there, there was really a split within the organization about this, but in the end, the, the, organi the, the faction or the members who wanted to, to become uh, part of the bureaucracy, that won out. In terms of the outcomes, there were actually positive outcomes and negative outcomes, like with anything, with the organization's bureaucratization. So it really gave the organization more stability and certainty in terms of its hierarchy, in terms of career paths, in terms of responsibilities. It gave the organization greater financial transparency and accountability because all of a sudden the resources and the budgets that the organization had had to go through parliamentary oversight approval and couldn't just be distributed in an ad hoc fashion. Uh, by, by the Central Council in Tehran to the provinces and villages. It also led to internal professionalization and cultivation of expertise. And this was something that, you know, um, the, the current Supreme Leader, Ali Khamenei, who was president at the time, and then going into the presidency of, of Rafsanjani, uh, later into the 80s, they, 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 this emphasis starts to shift between ta'ahud, the, the commitment of, of revolutionaries, to ta'hasus, the expertise. So this is really a time where that is cultivated. And, um, you know, there, there's recruit, recruitment that's based on this, there's advancement that's based on this, and this becomes an important component of the organization. In terms of the negatives of the organization, the organization becomes increasingly centralized, uh, increasingly uh, really constrained by red tape, uh, and uh, over the years, as it becomes a ministry and then merges with the Ministry of Agriculture, a lot of former members who are now working there complain that they can't do something without getting a supervisor's signature, unlike in the early days when they could go out and implement projects. Um, I mean, of course, there may be positive and, as and negative aspects to that. Careerism, where people talk about construction job initially being an altruistic organization, people really wanted to help the poor, they wanted to help uh, villagers and, and really work for rural reconstruction development. Now people like, they talk about during the times of the Shah, even though they might be exaggerating that, all of a sudden people are concerned more about their careers and their salaries and their advancement than they are about the, the, the greater good of, of rural reconstruction and development. Um, creating, as I mentioned, entanglements, uh, the organization also started either poaching companies from other ministries or establishing them themselves. So all of a sudden, there's a focus on corporatization and revenues, um, redundancies that are created within different divisions of the, of the organization and the ministry, along with redundancies between the Ministry of Reconstruction Job and other ministries, which explain why uh, elites start to look at merging um, different ministries together. And then the duality that you see in Reconstruction Jihad, that's really a microcosm of the Islamic Republic itself, where you have within the, the, the leadership of the organization, a representative of the supreme leader that represents his interests, and a representative or a minister actually of the president, who's appointed, of course, by the president with a parliamentary vote of confidence, who really represents the, the vision, the worldview, the priorities of, of the president and, and elites that are, that are in the parliament and in the presidency and in the cabinet. So you have this duality of leadership, very much like you have in the Islamic Republic itself, leading to conflicting priorities and missions. Um, and, and that making that difficult really to, to put the organization on one track in terms of where it should be heading. What happens at the micro level is that you, again, you have positive and negative outcomes. You have um, former activists that are now part of this bureaucracy that experienced fatigue, apathy, and disillusionment over the, what they see as a, a deviation from commitment, what they see as stagnancy and inefficiency. Uh, also, at the same time, you have former members of the organization who experience uh, really high levels of, some at least, uh, high levels of political and social mobility. So you see them becoming not just high level officials within the Ministry of Reconstruction Jihad, but even within the government itself. For example, if you look at uh, President Rouhani's cabinet today, a lot of them are former members and uh, officials of Reconstruction Jihad. And, um, and others experience political and social mobility and economic mobility as uh, officials within the uh, corporations that are affiliated with the ministry, uh, or even move away from Reconstruction Jihad and excel in other uh, facets of the policy and in the economy. So, you know, when I was meeting with former members, some of them, again, were, were high-level 
corporate executives uh, or were occupying important positions in government or in society. Um, so, you know, this really led to a lot of mobility for former members. Now, what ended up happening is that not all um, former activists and members of the organization were absorbed into the bureaucracy. Some of them went out, or even those that were, went out into society and established uh, grassroots uh, volunteer groups and civic associations. So they're very much a part of the, the associationalism that we see today in the Islamic Republic. And so when you see their organizations on the ground, and I was able to visit some, some that have been around even as early as the 1980s, others that were established more recently in the 2000s, you see that they're very much appropriating uh, the, the rhetoric, the discourse, even the activities of Reconstruction Jihad when it had existed. So one example is that, uh, well, aside from raising awareness about the organization and what it had done, because now that it's a merged entity with the Ministry of Agriculture since 2001, people are forgetting this organization. So part of the mission of some of these organizations is to raise awareness about the organization, even if it's a, a nostalgic awareness. Uh, part of it is to try to keep its the spirit of the organization alive and, and what it stood for. And so some of these organizations and groups have set up with, uh, camps, what they've called jihad camps or hijra camps. And, and they send students out and youth and, uh, and other uh, citizens to villages, to provinces, to undertake projects related to reconstruction and development. Uh, and so, you know, part of this is really members trying to keep the organization, at least what it originally stood for and what it originally did alive. Um, and others th taking advantage of this to try to advance their own political agendas. So, um, you know, the, what you see is, is that some of these groups and associations became increasingly securitized, became increasingly associated with the uh, Revolutionary Guard, with the Basij, and are mobilizing students and youth out to provinces and villages to undertake projects, but also as part of a process of socialization or indoctrination or recruitment for these organizations. Uh, and um, at the same time, these organizations, even though they ha have close relationships and you can even say there's an element of co-optation and, and corporatism where they're connected to political elites, at the same time, they also engage in advocacy and activism and lobbying. So, you know, for example, there's one uh, group and association that represents the trench builders without trenches and other uh, members of the organization that have been involved in the Iran Iraq war and are war veterans today. Some of them are, are, are injured or maimed are, are sick from exposure to chemical weapons. And they're lobbying the political elites that they're connected to for greater compensation for war veterans or for other benefits to former members of the organization, whether they're war veterans or whether they're former members that participated in reconstruction and development. So, you know, even though these aren't, I wouldn't say autonomous groups, they represent a seedbed or a, you know, a, a source of what could be uh, autonomous activism. I mean, when you look at what they do, they're very much doing it through groups and associations and organizations that are connected to the government. So again, I wouldn't call them autonomous, but they are in a position from below to put pressure on political elites, and they do. So, you know, it's important to look at this bi-directionality. So here's a sign Eric, that I, yeah. I hate to interrupt you. Okay. Would you be able to wrap up with the next two, three minutes? Yeah, I just absolutely. to give you a heads up. Thank you. Sure, thanks, thanks. So Eric, here's a sign of a, oh, sorry, yeah. So, so here's a sign I saw of, of one of these organizations that recruits outside of, a, outside of Yazd and a conservative part of Yazd um, in terms of in, encouraging uh, students to partake in the organization uh, or one of these organizations and go out to do reconstruction and development in some of the villages. Here's some logos of these organizations, the Jihadist Association, uh, the Association of Trench Builders Without Trenches. Again, they have the same uh, logo that Construction Jihad have, and they use the same slogan all together, Hame Baham. So I, I don't have time. We can discuss it in the Q&A, but the book, of course, talks about the foreign policy of the Islamic Republic through Reconstruction Jihad, how it essentially used the organization, not just in Lebanon, but also in Africa and other parts of the 
uh, Middle East and Muslim or even non-Muslim world to uh, try to mitigate the Islamic Republic's uh, international isolation and establish diplomatic and commercial relations with other countries, which, which it has successfully done through reconstruction and development. Um, so this is the Lebanese part of it that we can discuss. Uh, here's the, the branch of Reconstruction Jihad in Lebanon that has a, a more militarized slogan in Arabic that together we build, together we resist. But again, this concept of togetherness that you see from the very beginning of the organization, these similar framing devices that are used. And then just to, to end here, um, like I said, we see the former members of the organization, like we see uh, um, uh, Nargis uh, Bachjoli has written about this uh, in her book that uh, members of the IRGC and Besiege engage in cultural production. Same with former members of Reconstruction Jihad in terms of building, uh, whether it's through conferences, whether it's literature that they're disseminating today in Iran, whether it's the National Week of Commemoration for Reconstruction Jihad, whether it's the museum that was recently built uh, several years ago that commemorates you know, the culture of resistance and the war. Uh, Reconstruction Jihad is very much present in all of these national symbols and its former members, whether they're in the government or outside of it in these grassroots organizations, are working together to build what I would say a nostalgic, romanticized, even at times ambiguous uh, uh, concept of this ideal type organization and its members as ar archetypal jihadists. Uh, that we're always doing the right thing and, and contributing the right way to society revol in, a, in a revolutionary and religious way. Um, and what they're really trying to do is to positively transform, at least the way they see it, you know, the, the government, the bureaucracy, the society to try to emulate those practices and values. On the other hand, you have political elites and you even see in, in, in uh, recent presidential campaigns political elites, whatever side of the spectrum they're on, using this language. And so on the one hand, there's former members of the organization who are very happy to see this and others who are very disillusioned and disenchanted and saying that this is just being exploited for political purposes and this is diluting what the organization really stood for. There's a lot of resentment there, which I found interesting. So I'll, I'll end right here and, um, and thank you very much. I'm looking forward to, to the discussion. Thank you so much, Eric, for this wonderful presentation. And uh, to everyone out there who hasn't read the book, it's a must read for anyone who wants to research this topic and um, uh, and uh, in particular, the uh, state building in Iran. This is a novel view uh, on it. And let me uh, start uh, actually just there and in relation to um, what you ended with, and that's the relationship between Reconstruction Jihad, Jihad Sazandegi, and um, the rest of revolutionary organizations and later on uh, state institutions that have commonly been put at the center of Iranian state building, such as uh, Basij Mustazafin uh, or uh, the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps, which have been the center of so many other uh, research projects and books. Um, so how do you see, I mean, you talked uh, a bit about it, but how do you see the interactions between the Reconstruction Jihad and uh, the Basij and the IRGC in particular? What would you say if someone uh, contends that Jawad Sazandegi was working on the margins of Basij and the IRGC, it, it didn't play the central role that you're attributing to it? Um, I can imagine some critique coming up. Uh, your book is convincing uh, uh, answering to that critique, but why did you, I want you to tell us more uh, for the audience. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, the, the relationship is definitely there from very early on. And uh, one thing I should say is apart from the Iran-Iraq war, the Islamic Republic in the late 70s and early 80s was facing uh, these uh, rebellions and uprisings in, on the peripheries of the country and in, in ethnic and, uh, and religious minority areas. And so Reconstruction Jihad was not just did not just play an instrumental war in giving logistical support to the 
not the conventional military and the IRGC and the best siege during the war, but they also were part of these counterinsurgency efforts. Uh, Natek Nori himself in his memoirs, he was the first representative of Reconstruction Jihad, Khomeini's first representative in the organization. I had a hunch about this, but I was excited to see it in his memoirs in the Library of Congress. He clearly said that our intention was to try to, and you see this in other counterinsurgency campaigns outside of Iran, our effort through reconstruction development was to, to try to win the hearts and minds of the population and to divide them between the people who were getting these projects and services from the insurgents. And so we wanted, to, they wanted to help the, uh, I'm sorry, the IRGC in these counterinsurgency efforts. There's also stories that when members of the organization were going to these areas, they would come under attack. Some of them lost their lives for going to these areas and trying to deliver projects. Uh, they talk about you know, coming under attack by, by groups in these areas. And so when things, when, when they were in those situations, they actually admitted to turning to the IRGC and the security forces to helping them out, you know, so they can go in and do these projects or even to, to get out. And uh, of course, you know, villagers didn't always take kindly to this and, and, and saw the organization as affiliated with the IRGC, as affiliated with the, the government. And so this led to resentment uh, among you know, certain segments of the population. And, um, you know, and then, as I say later, when the former members of the organization start to establish these, you know, if you want to call them grassroots organizations or parastatal organizations where they're mobilizing and socializing students and youth to go out to the villages, this becomes increasingly securitized. And you see the IRGC and the Bastige appropriating these organizations or even uh, establishing similar ones to emulate them. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there's some who, who agree with this process and there's others within the organization who don't, you know, and say that we want to remain our, an, ind uh, an independent entity. Uh, and so, you know, these debates go on. Uh, you know, more recently, and uh, I have hopefully an article coming up out about this this year, you know, Reconstruction Jihad became a ministry, then it became part of the Ministry of Agriculture. And a lot of these people are sitting in Tehran or, or elsewhere around Iran as bureaucrats. But there's a new version now of Reconstruction Jihad that you're seeing, for example, in the conflict zone of Syria today, that is part of the Quds Force of uh, the IRGC. And they're doing similar things that they did during the Iran-Iraq war, during the counterinsurgency, where they're del delivering goods and services to parts of the Syrian population. And there's actually a large part of its membership are Syrians. They're not, they're being advised by Iranians, but they're, it's not Iranian, you know, student youth and other people themselves that are going out to do this. And so this very concept is still being used today, but in, you know, in a securitized way in, in, in Syria. Um, and so that, you know, you, you can't write about Reconstruction Jihad without talking about these relationships with the, the IRGC and the Besiege and other segments of the security forces and military. Thank you. Yeah, that's very interesting. Actually, let me uh, pick up on that and uh, ask you to talk more about uh, the Reconstruction Jihad's international like extraterritorial reach, uh, especially because you didn't get to talk about it. Uh, during the presentation. Uh, this is fascinating, like you're mentioning their presence in Syria now. I uh, don't know much about it and I'd love to hear more. Uh, you, in the talk, you have these two amazing chapters on uh, how uh, they went on missions in a few African countries as well as Lebanon. And the fascinating thing for me was that it starts at least the intention of sending Jihad, uh, jihad Gars or uh, uh, RJ people out to these countries starts in the mid 80s when Iran is still at war with Iraq. So I found that very interesting and very thought provoking. Uh, although, uh, as I, uh, if I remember correctly, it doesn't actually happen until the end of the war. But the very uh, idea of the, uh, the Islamic Republic and uh, the reconstruction jihad considering this is interesting. So if you want to talk more about that and also tell us what you think about the different trajectories that uh, Reconstruction Jihad took in Africa as, uh, again, uh, as opposed to Lebanon, my understanding was that in Africa, it's more of a strategic provision of services 
for later uh, uh, like political strategic benefits. Whereas in Lebanon, it's an uh, emulation of the organization. It's more of an institution building approach that is, is either intentionally taken or just like comes to be. Um, so yeah, please tell yeah. us more. Sure, so really, I mean, as you said, during the war, uh, Construction job, reconstruction job, it's already a ministry, you know, by 1983. And by the mid-1980s, it starts to go out on missions to African countries, to Lebanon, and even elsewhere, um, Bosnia and, and other parts of the world. Uh, and uh, it's done in a very formalized way, because now it's a ministry. It's not a revolutionary organization. So... You know, there's meetings between uh, ministry officials, there's meetings even between political officials. I mean, often this was done, you'll notice the, the president of Iran or even the supreme leader um, taking, actually I believe it was the presidents taking trips out to Africa and, and, and sitting down with the highest levels and even inviting them to Iran where they would have talks at the ministry. So it was very formalized and it had to be approved at the highest levels and parliament also had to weigh in on, on budgets for these activities and approve them. Um, and so, you know, when you talk about Africa, it's, it's not an ad hoc process at all. It's not activists going out like, you know, you might think about the Peace Corps, uh, you know, it, and, and they, it's a really, I mean, it's an opportunity for them because, um, you know, Africa has these large agrarian economies uh, it has a high, high levels of rural poverty uh, and other developmental challenges. So there's really an opportunity for the organization to go. And it goes both in countries that have large Muslim populations, but also countries that don't. Uh, and um, and, and uh, so the organization, you know, initially it, it talked about doing both religion and culture and material development in terms of helping farmers and helping uh, villagers in the way that it did in Iran. Uh, giving them, uh, you know, um, goods and services that they need, helping them with agricultural mechanization and production, also with animal husbandry and helping them exploit uh, their livestock in the best way possible, even vocational training. Uh, and they really fill a niche there, even if they're, if it's limited investment, you know, they don't have the resources that the United States or China or some of these bigger countries have. The other thing I'm discovering is that when they're doing this, it coincides actually with Arab Gulf countries doing this as well. Uh, and so there's a competition as well in Africa between uh, Iran, between the Arab Gulf countries that are doing similar things, between also Israel and Turkey. Uh, and so, you know, Africa becomes this area of competition. You know, and over time, the, the members of the organization told me that they, they, they really kind of dropped the religious and cultural act part of the, their portfolio of the activities and really focused on material development. Uh, and really the, the more ideological, cultural, religious activities fell under the umbrella of the Supreme Leader and the IRGC and other organizations going into Africa. I mean, perhaps construction job would help build mosques, but you know, these organizations really took the lead uh, the cultural attache at the embassy in these activities. In Lebanon, you have, uh, and by the way, these activities in Africa are still going on with the ministry today uh, and things that I still continue to follow. Uh, so that has not gone away uh, despite, you know, sanctions. In, uh, in Lebanon, you know, this starts in the 80s. Again, it's very formalized. And, but the interesting thing is that they go in with the intention of, like they did during the Iran-Iraq war, of creating a unit for Hezbollah, of giving them logistical support in their guerrilla op operations. But Hezbollah really, really has that covered with the IRGC and other entities. So then they shift to helping Hezbollah provide similar uh, reconstruction and development services to the constituents to help win hearts and minds, to mobilize, to socialize constituents. And over time, it becomes a localized organization. So, you know, I make the argument that, you know, this really where you see Hezbollah asserting its autonomy in terms of uh, asserting control over projects, localizing personnel, and even trying to at times diversify resources away from just the Islamic Republic. Because, you know, different, there's different presidencies in Iran over time, and there's different relationships between Iran and Hezbollah. 
Um, so the dynamics change. But today, really, uh, when you go to Lebanon, uh, uh, Reconstruction Jihad is really a Lebanese and Hezbollah entity. Um, it may be receiving funding from Iran, but it's a Lebanese operation. And so even in Syria today, you see the Lebanese Reconstruction Jihad do, you know, pursuing its own activities with the Syrian government versus the IRGC and Quds uh, Reconstruction Jihad. Um, so, you know, and, 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 you know, maybe tacitly they're cooperating, but they're really kind of their own organizations. So I, I don't know if there's other things that you'd want me to answer related to that aspect. No, that's, that's fascinating. Um, I'll, I'll uh, the slightly shift the focus of the same issue, but uh, there's so much more interesting uh, in your work to talk about. Um, so if one could say there seems to be, as you said, a very bureaucratized uh, uh, sort of not ad hoc pre-planned uh, 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 decision to go to, uh, to go invest in um, Africa. And then uh, what happened in Lebanon, although it was also planned, uh, it could be more similar to the revolutionary grassroots spirit of uh, the Re uh, Reconstruction Jihad, although it's a ministry by now, it's bureaucratized. So I'm wondering if you see uh, a continuation of this revolutionary modus operandi um, within uh, the, the Ministry of Jihad and even later on in uh, Ministry of Jihad and Ag Agriculture when it sort of uh, starts to um, uh, wane the, the organization as it, uh, as it existed in the early years. In the book, my impression was that you're suggesting that although it is bureaucratized, there are some contradictions going on. It's not always transparent. It's not always uh, uh, like hierarchical, but can we see it not as a contradiction, but as an essential feature of revolutionary institution being institutionalized further into the bureaucracy? And uh, if we see that as the essence of its um, underlying dynamics, how would it change our view of uh, how it operated um, beyond the revolutionary years, especially because after 1983, there are still five years of the war going on, which yeah. allows them to still act impromptu in the name of the war. This is what the IRGC did actually, like even after they received funding, they, were ex they expanded massively after 1982, they continued to operate uh, much in the spirit of um, the previous years, and the war was the war was always like uh, the contingency that justified it. They were, they were like, we don't have to bureaucratize, we don't have to profession, we don't have time to professionalize. So I wonder if you see a similar trend in reconstruction jihad. Great questions. Uh, to get to, I guess, the second part of the question in terms of the war years. So I would say that the difference between the trajectory of Reconstruction Jihad versus the IRGC and the Besiege is that, I mean, you know, as you said, the, the IRGC briefly becomes a ministry, but then doesn't, you know, uh, stops being a ministry. And um, with Reconstruction Jihad, it becomes a ministry. And essentially the fate of these activists is, and like you said, it creates contradictory outcomes and even sentiments among them, uh, is that, you know, you're, you were revolutionary activists, you're now gonna be bureaucrats. And what ends up happening is that a parallel institution is created in 1983 called uh, Construction or Reconstruction Mobilization, <laughs> where that will be the more ad hoc organization. And you have, you know, similar activities going on where you have, uh, you know, students and youth and other activists and citizens uh, and, you know, there is a relationship there with the IRGC and the Besiege going out to do uh, reconstruction development related projects and services in provinces and villages. They also continue to do that logistical support uh, to support these forces. And so there's kind of a, a separation of competency, of responsibility, of involvement, um, where, uh, I mean, some, you know, some will maybe join the ministry later after doing these things. But it's really now this separation where now you're in this bureaucratic space, even during the war years. 
And, uh, you know, and you see this expansion, like I said, with, um, with, you know, different divisions and corporations that are and companies that are developed. Uh, and, uh, and so I think that's where the trajectory differentiates there because of that parallel institution, uh, the, the construction mobilization. The, the second part of your question, though, in terms of, you know, how this unfolds over time and the contradictions, I mean, you absolutely see it. And I attribute a lot of that. I mean, of course, part of it is revolution because, and even in this case, religious revolution. I mean, what's interesting is not all of Reconstruction Jihad's founders and members were necessarily pious. I mean, some were, but maybe on a private level. Uh, like I said, some wanted to really engage in this effort to Islamize the countryside. And others were really focused and they were more leftist minded. They were really focused on, um, you know, land reform, continuing the Shah's land reform efforts, uh, nationalization, redistribution of wealth, improving reconstruction and development materially, some of whom, you know, they're doing it in their hometown provinces and villages to also have self-interest in doing that. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, they find themselves in this bureaucracy and they feel that those aspirations are being put on hold, that they can't just go out there and do what they used to do. Now, there was some merit to this because some of them were inexperienced or didn't necessarily do adequate planning. So mistakes were made. Resources were wasted. Um, that was also a narrative that was used to attack them. Um, but. Uh, you know, there was some validity to now, you know, professionalizing, institutionalizing this organization, focusing more on planning. But in many ways, people feel that these original values and practices of the organization got lost. Because like I said, careerism took over, red tape took over, uh, corporations were established or taken from other ministries emphasis on revenues, emphasis on cost benefit analysis and efficiency. And so today, what you see is, at least when I was there, is you see these former revolutionary activists that are still channeling that energy, but they're doing it in a very bureaucratic and corporatized fashion. So in one section of the book, I talk about these individuals who are putting together these conferences and Putting and uh, putting together and disseminating and producing publications to try to keep the spirit of jihadi management and culture alive, right? Like I talked about a little bit in this presentation, but they're doing it, you know, in these buildings, in these buildings of the bureaucracy. They're doing it wearing jackets, of course, without ties, but they're delivering PowerPoint presentations and in meeting rooms. And at the end, you know, this is, you know, how revolutionary is this, right? Uh, you know, maybe the farthest they can go is to do it through their grassroots organizations, but even those have been somewhat co-opted and, uh, and, and corporatized by political elites, right? So they can only go so far. So you know, they often lament the centralization and the bureaucrat bureaucrat bureaucratization, not just of Reconstruction Jihad, but of the Islamic Republic as a whole. And that is an outcome you actually do see as being consistent with revolutionary states like Russia and, and China and others. Yeah, that's very interesting. And I am terribly sorry to say that we're running out of time. I would like to still ask at least 10 more questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, it's fascinating how your work shows that, as you said, although uh, the uh, outcome state of state building in Iran uh, matches those of other uh, major social revolutions that we've seen through history, but there's also uh, uh, things going on within the Iranian state institutions and parallel institutions, especially because of the parallel structure that are resembling, that are trying to carry with them something from uh, the social dynamics and uh, the ethos of revolutionary days. And um, Reconstruction Jihad has not been studied, studied systematically as one such example. And your uh, book does a great job of uh, filling that void. Let me thank you again for accepting our uh, invitation and for your wonderful book. And uh, wish you luck with uh, the future projects. Thank you very much for having me. It was really a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks.